So Benedict is going to talk about uh, mesh networking, IPFS, and other distributed ways of building your own in internet. So yeah, please welcome Benedict. Thank you. Uh, thank you, very everyone, for being here today. Um, it's really exciting to see people interested in peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, it's also a really good timing. Uh, I have been having a lot of thoughts about uh, a talk like this. Uh, and this gives me a perfect opportunity to organize all this information together into a, into a one-hour presentation. Um, so let's begin. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols for our cyber commons. I'm going to start with talking about living with the, our internet. Um, that could mean many things to different people. It could be very optimistic. All these great things happening on the internet. And now we're at a time where we can create many things that were not imaginable before. Or it could be like very negative. It could be like, uh, like coping with the internet. Every day you're like, uh, it's not the web that I'm used to before. Um, that's also possible. Uh, and then the next step would be talking about networks uh, that exist right now in the distributed web. And then we're going to start talking about political politics of our networks. What that means is uh, some of the design decisions in these networks embed certain politics that allows for certain types of societies to emerge. Uh, and we want to explore uh, the protocols in the context of that. And then <laughs> lastly, um, fabric of our cyber commons. Uh, what what is it that uh, will make up the future internet that we, that we all want? So let's start with living with our internet. That's pretty much the front page for the internet right now. Uh, a lot of times when I start clicking around, I click into a link, and I'm prompt, prompted with a Facebook login or like some other silo data login. So Facebook has successfully inserted itself in the middle of solving this very high problem, uh, content distribution on the internet. On the internet, if you control the demand, you control a lot of the supply. Um, and Facebook became this middleman that uh, controls a lot of the demand because everyone is on the network. And uh, content publishers start publishing uh, not only to their own site, but also to Facebook. And if we look at statistics, we actually see that Facebook has, uh, has grown a lot in uh, being the referral source of traffic to uh, many, many top web publishers. Uh, Google actually remained pretty stable. Uh, like from 2012 to 2015, um, they occupied about the same percentage wise. Um, but what we see is like the other ones uh, referral traffic from random websites is really going down. And one day I was browsing and I discovered this, uh, this news site being served from a Google domain, which is really weird to me. Uh, so then I started looking into it and I, I found this thing called accelerated mobile pages. Uh, basically, uh, because mobile adoption, adoption is going up and Google is taking content from the news sites. Uh, news sites are publishing to a, uh, to, to in a way that AMP can, can ingest it, and then serving it through Google CDN instead. So in this like, very mobile first world, uh, Google is, again, uh, it's good for performance reasons on our phone, but it also inserted Google into the middle of uh, serving content. Um, and this sort of mobile ecosystem is a little dangerous because it's even more restricted than uh, our desktop environments. Uh, we have two, two ecosystems, basically. And for example, in uh, the Catalonia referendum, we had Google Play uh, being asked to take out the referendum app, and that happened. And in the, Google, and in the Apple Store, uh, the takedown of apps are even more unreasonable. And when we talk about apps uh, ecosystems, 
we, we can take a look at our phone and how many of those apps maybe are not branded Google, but how many of those actually are indirectly owned by Google or Facebook or Apple or one of these major players on the internet. Which brings us to the question of data ownership under surveillance capitalism. Um, whether we like it or not, our web is currently uh, incentivized in a way that <coughs> encourages surveillance capitalism. It's not that anyone working at these companies have a particular interest in our personal lives, but the incentives are lined up in a way where it, where data sells, where uh, it's important to own a lot of the people's data in order to in order to serve ads targeted to that to, to that group of users, which in turn uh, is how to pay for all this development work. And we may think that we can just like put away our phone and we don't we, we're not tracked. We can turn off our phone or like I have nothing to hide. But it doesn't stop here. In Toronto, we have a project called Sidewalk Toronto. Uh, it's, it has two main players. One is Alphabet owned, uh, Sidewalk Labs. The other one being the government. Um, it's a project where at the waterfront of Toronto, there will be a s s little neighborhood that's built from the internet up. Um, this can be viewed favorably. Some people think it's really great to uh, not have all these inefficiencies in our public infrastructure. Uh, now we can use data to drive the next uh, uh, wave of innovative cities. Uh, so it means uh, IoT, it means automation. Um, but we are now into 2017, 2018 part of this, um, where we just had uh, a round of public consultation and there has been a lot of um, a lot of friction and a lot of frustration with the public consultation process. Uh, the data policy stuff is never addressed properly, um, and multiple people on the on the Sidewalk Toronto side have uh, resigned over this from the from the advisory panel. Um, so we're still in this uncertain phase whether this, this will uh, continue or uh, maybe it would never happen. Nobody knows. When we start having internet infrastructure uh, permeating all of our living spaces, uh, we have to think about social control with this level of data aggregation. Uh, it's not news that many platforms are struggling with moderation problems, censorship problems. It's a very hard problem to solve when you have one person having, or like one organization having control over all that data. Reddit with their quarantined uh, subreddits, um, making, basically making uh, certain subreddits harder to access and not serving ads on them because like some, some brands are like, these are like very unsavory uh, subreddits. I don't want any brand association with them. Uh, and similar, similar stories with uh, YouTube, some, some videos are not uh, getting ad revenue. So we don't really have a solution to this. And then the next thing is digital imperialism by high barrier infrastructure. Uh, we have our net neutrality uh, erosion um, in many places in the world now. Uh, US, that already happened. And in Canada, there's also conversations around uh, prioritizing certain traffic. Uh, and when we think about who is in the best position to uh, have higher priority, we have to think about who owns, who, who, are, who are the users of most of our traffic. It's the, it's the bigger providers of web content. And not only do I think that these companies will be favored in the future, but they're also building private infrastructures, connecting, uh, building fibers that connect um, different cities. Um, so you see how some of these fibers are owned by uh, Microsoft, and you have this one that's uh, connecting to South, to South America that's owned by Google exclusively, and then you have some partnerships between Facebook and Google, uh, Facebook and Microsoft. Uh, 
So we, so we have all these things that we used to have uh, separated from the web providers. Now we're having them owned also by the, the providers of content on the internet. And then when we put another map on top, uh, who currently has internet adoption, uh, we see that there are regions of the world where in the next five years will be the first time that uh, many people are finding out and interfacing with this world, which is deeply troubling. Because what is the internet that they're going to see? Are there other ways that we can build networks that do not have these tendencies? And this brings us to the next part of the talk, uh, networks of a distributed web. And in this talk, I want to speak about a few networks that are existing and the protocols that they, that they use, um, which in later sections we can talk about uh, in relation to the previous problems that, 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 that was in the previous section. Uh, so some of these networks are Ether. Ether is like, uh, it's like Reddit, but completely peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so it does have to tackle the moderation problem and all that sort of stuff, but in a uh, decentralized way. Uh, Giphy.net is a telecommunication physical infrastructure in covering most of Catalonia. Uh, it's, it welcomes both uh, businesses and uh, individuals or uh, community organizations all bound by a, the phone com compact. Um, it's in existence for more than 10 years, but then like uh, things networks that eventually made up Giphy uh, has almost 20 years of history. And it's the primary internet provider for a lot of communities. Hyperborea is a CJDNS network. CJDNS is the protocol uh, that, for, that forms an encrypted IPv6 network. And uh, it's, a, it's very permissionless, meaning anyone running some software can join. Um, and Hyperborea right now has more than 1,000 nodes. And we're going to talk extensively about this. Interplanetary file system, uh, also called IPFS, with its uh, networking layer called libp2p. Uh, it's a content addressed hypermedia protocol. What that means is uh, you can fetch stuff from the network without addressing a particular host. We'll talk more in depth about that. Uh, Scuttlebutt, secure Scuttlebutt. The scale wars. Uh, it has uh, a the idea of mapping uh, network topologies into social relationship topologies. Um, we can see how what type of communities emerges from that. Uh, the Idrasil network is closely related to the CJDNS network, and it takes a different path to how uh, distributed what routing works. And there are many other participants in the distributed web, uh, but these are the ones that we'll focus on. So let's begin with uh, Giphy, <coughs> the network in Catalonia. Uh, the phone compact is more like a license or a contract than a protocol, but uh, I think we can also look at it <coughs> from a protocol perspective. It establishes shared values among community organizations and businesses. Uh, that that's primary reason is to provide internet access to neighborhoods and people. Um, the, the compact is there to facilitate and maintain the expansion uh, the network, uh, of the network. And the physical infrastructure consists of wired, wireless, and, and fiber networks all together. Uh, it, it's there to prevent privatization of physical infrastructure, but also at the same time allowing uh, business incentives to exist so then it can be a maintained network. <coughs> so the phone compact consists of four main, four main points. You have the freedom to use the network for any purpose as long as you don't harm the operation of the network itself. The rights of the users or the principles of neutrality that allows contents and services to flow without deliberate interference. So this already, any, any organization that's bound by the phone compact already uh, has these uh, 
anti or net neutral uh, principles in mind. These are like the shared values that I'm, that I'm talking about. You have the right to understand the network and its components and to share knowledge of its mechanisms and principles. So you can't, uh, you can't exclude people from like proprietary knowledge. You have the right, to, the right to offer services and content to the network on your own terms. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't force other players to behave in certain ways as long as you're like bound by this compact. You have the right to join the network and the obligation to extend this set of rights to anyone according to the same terms. Uh, this is like a copy left type of, uh, th type of rule. And now let's talk about the, the technical layer. It's a mix of uh, different types of links. And usually it's run by proprietary uh, carrier grade hardware from Ubiquiti or Microtech. Uh, routing, there, there are these small regions inside the circles that use more dynamic routing mechanisms like VMX6 or OSPF. Uh, and the backbone network is another layer where each community, say like Barcelona and Mataro, they would like talk uh, through more stable uh, routing mechanisms uh, with BGP. Is, uh, the network itself is maintained by ISPs that are bound by the phone comp compact and uh, also community organizations. So what does it actually look like? This is on the roof of a, of a city that's 40 minutes, 40 minutes away from Barcelona. It's, uh, this is one of the super nodes. Uh, looking at this, you can see uh, a whole bunch of ubiquitous antennas. So a super node is hard to visualize, but in this case, it's like the entire roof. It has more than 10 of these antennas pointing in all sorts of directions. And more recently, uh, they built a fiber segment that's uh, collaboratively funded by a user, uh, which is a cooperative just down the street. Um, and also one of the Giphy ISPs operating in the region and uh, the foundation itself. So collaboratively, they built a long segment of fiber that goes right up to this node. And they're going to extend it from the co-op to this node very soon. Um, so if you, if you think about the way that uh, people generally access, inter access the internet, you, you, call your, you call one of the ISPs. But when the ISP says, oh, you live too far away, I'm not going to provide internet access to you, then you're kind of stuck. There's no way for uh, regular citizens to uh, participate in the building of the network itself. So, that's very different when we have a uh, commons infrastructure, uh, where it, it gives opportunities to anyone to uh, ask questions about, hey, ha why is it that I cannot build this segment? Uh, what if I pay for it? Uh, and because this segment that's built will eventually go back into the commons, so it will also benefit future, uh, future users. So Givy is really great. Uh, it allows for this type of interactions to exist, uh, but there are also centralized components within Giphy. Uh, if you're a regular person trying to connect to that tower, you need to first get, get an IP address. Uh, this is done through a centralized database that you submit, uh, or you submit a form in, uh, on the Giphy website. Uh, and the maintenance of the BGP backbone network is also quite centralized. So, uh, what, are, what are the problems with this type of centralization? Uh, if we look at the data of internet core routers, so these are not Giphy data. This is like internet BGP uh, data, where we take, uh, we take forwarding tables and look at how many prefixes are announced. We see that the internet has grown in the last little while. It didn't become smaller. Uh, we, we, had, we had a lot more IPv6 uh, uh, prefixes being announced. Uh, and w we can also look at the proportional distribution. Most of them are 24-bit <laughs> announcements, meaning uh, they are like small blocks of IPs that makes up uh, almost 50% of, uh, of the forwarding tables, which puts a huge load on these core routers, meaning uh, we, we require uh, more expensive specialized equipment and expertise to maintain. Uh, 
and all these all these small blocks of IPs actually make up only that tiny portion of the entire uh, address space. So the next graph on the right is uh, the same data, but shown uh, as contributions to the address space. So if we want uh, routing or connectivity to be more accessible to, to general people, uh, not to a small group of specialists, uh, we can think about routing and approach it differently. There's a study, there's a topic called uh, compact routing, which in relation to BGP type of interdomain routing, uh, it focuses on keeping small amounts of routing data at each table, rather than piling all this work onto a core, a core network infrastructure itself. So it also makes it very difficult to do because now what, what we used to do is have a full view of the network. Uh, but without that, how do we determine shortest path between two points when I do not see the entire network? Uh, because algorithms like Dextra, uh, as used in OSPF, uses, uh, assumes like a full view of the network that, and, and use, use that data to derive shortest path routing. So the goal is to have, to, is to not find the shortest path all the time, but have a uh, have a bound to how much worse the path would be. So instead of maybe two hop is the shortest path, uh, a stretch of uh, four would mean uh, a, a stretch of two would mean like you you now have four hops as the upper bound, and try to also in most cases uh, be able to route the shortest path. And at the same time, allow for routing tables to not grow at the same rate as the number of nodes scale. And there are also, you can also classify compact routing into two different uh, categories. One is name independent routing. The other one is name dependent routing. Name dependent routing means uh, the, the maintainer, maintainer of the network can assign names to the nodes, uh, which means you can uh, arrange them in blocks or like encode some sort of routing information in the names of the roads of the nodes themselves um, before deploying this network. Uh, but name independent schemes assume randomly generated, completely fragmented address spaces. Uh, a harder problem, but it allows for networks to exist without, without like a layer of management on top. People can just join this network. So I want to steer our attention to routing traffic in a non-hierarchical network with flat, uh, with flat IDs that are all self-addressing. And one of the projects is called CJDNS. It auto-configures an overlay network. It's actually very easy to join the, the Hyperborea network. Um, and in this world, because uh, anyone can join, all the traffic has to be end-to-end -end encrypted uh, and it uses the following crypto primitives. It self-assigns a IPv6 address uh, by deriving one from the cryptographic keys. Uh, this is a private block of the, of the v6 space. And it can, it, it does source routing in a, with a Kademnia-like distributed hash table, which there are three things here that are, uh, special terms, uh, self-assignment, and source route, and distributed hash table, which we're going to go into right now. <laughs> self-assignment of IPv6 addresses, how does it work? Uh, basically, you do two rounds of SHA on the public key, and then you truncate it into a IPv6 address, a valid IPv6 address of a, in a particular space. So we'll never get a collision because there are so many addresses. Uh, but what about uh, the birthday problem? Uh, is it possible that we'll derive two IPv6 addresses or like two uh, public keys, two curved keys, and they end up with the same IPv6 address? So this is the calculation for uh, how likely that could happen. Um, and basically, it's very unlikely that that might happen. Next, we can talk about Kademnia DHT routing. Uh, we have a node called 0011. 
Uh, this would represent an IPv6 address in, in simpler, simpler terms. Uh, that's, the, that's the black dot over there. Uh, it, Cadenia allows us to learn paths from every neighborhood. So this node has a path which is different from peering. Uh, a path means it knows the hops to get to one of these neighborhoods. So each node would keep a routing table uh, at each XOR distance bucket. And this allows us to know our local neighborhood well, uh, and at the same time have less knowledge about distance ones, but also have a way of reaching each neighborhood. Um, so one example is when I try to come to Oslo, uh, I wouldn't ask someone in Toronto how to go to No, I would ask people how to get to Norway and then how to get to Oslo, and then I would ask someone how to get to No. Uh, so the, the, there's like neighborhoods that maintain more local knowledge. Let's go through an example of searching in this world. Um, 0011 uh, would first is trying to search for 1110. 1110 is over here, 1110, uh, but it doesn't know how to get there. It's going to ask 101, that's the arrow that, that's labeled 1, uh, because it knows how to get to 101. So from 101, it learns about 1101. And then successfully, it would query like this. Uh, and then iteratively, you get to closer and closer uh, to your destination. And what closer means in a space that's not physical, that's not geographic, uh, Kademlia uses something called an XOR distance. Uh, this is uh, an XOR between the two addresses. So 1101 is the, is the XOR distance between these two nodes. It has this unique property where uh, between two nodes, it has a distance that's, uh, that no, no other two nodes, like you're, you're, you're at a certain distance from this node, but some other node, you're at a different distance. And the distance between you and that node, and, and that node and you is the same, because the XOR you can like do the opposite way, and, and it's also the same uh, distance. So after 0011 learns a new path, um, it would put this path into its fourth bit position bucket. So now it knows the new path. And these buckets are uh, of a certain size that you can adjust. Uh, and because you, you would know your immediate neighbor well, it means like your first, second bit are the ones that you end up filling. Uh, when you fill that up, you already know the entire neighborhood. Whereas every next hop, you're, you're like, uh, you have less knowledge about them. Because the, the space corresponding to uh, your most significant bit is the space that holds half of the network. Now we can search. How can we actually deliver a packet from one point to the other? So we're going to label these two nodes in the previous example, Rick and Morty. Um, and we start like this in CGDNS, and source routing part of CGDNS. Uh, you assemble a set of directors that you tag onto a packet. So every packet gets, gets this 64-bit thing tagged onto them. And you see here multiple directors. They are like, uh, they're like instructions to turn left or right. And so because Morty knows, because Rick knows the path to Morty, it would put together these directors, expecting that its next hop and its like second hop, third hop would read. When Morty gets this thing, it would pop its director and just send it down its uh, write interface. R write interface could be, it means you have an actual cable connected to the other node. Of course, this cable can be wireless or it can be like tunnel over internet. It doesn't really matter what, the, what this uh, idea of a cable is, but it will send it down that interface. It could be like your if zero on, on your machine. Um, so it does that and the packet reaches summer. Summer is a peer of Morty on that interface. 
and then somewhere now sees the down director on her interface. So it would do the same thing, and then iteratively, the packet will eventually reach, uh, reach Morty. Oh no, sorry, not reaching Morty. This, this is uh, reaching 1110. One, one um, and then you may see that on the left hand side, there is a director that looks weird because by popping it, you append it to the end, and then you can flip it to get a return path. OK. So Hyperborea now has more than 1,000 nodes, uh, but it has some limitations at this scale. Uh, first of all, the XOR address space has no resemblance to physical space, which means I can be sending a packet from Toronto to Oslo and then like to back to Vancouver and then to Hong Kong. Uh, so s s some of the routing uh, is very inefficient in the real world. In network space, it makes perfect sense, but in the, in the physical sense, uh, it incurs a lot of unneeded uh, bouncing around of packets. And a bigger problem that we're running into is in the wireless mesh network, uh, nodes don't know the quality of links. It's OK when you have stable links, but when you have wireless droppy and changing topologies, source routing doesn't give you visibility like deep into multiple hops. And, and, and that causes uh, connectivity problems. Uh, and another problem is once the network is big enough, we start getting uh, many hops. And the 64-bit packet header cannot fit all of them. Uh, so CJDNS started implementing uh, the idea of a super node, which means some nodes can hold the whole routing table. And it starts uh, offering this as a service to like a, a path discovery as a service to the subnodes. Uh, so it can run Dextra to find shortest paths, but the downside is it's a point of centralization, even though the traffic themselves is still routed through the mesh. Question? Uh, I think it was on two or three slides ago, we saw that uh, as part of routing or as part of path discovery, you were querying a node who query other nodes. Yes. Does that introduce the vulnerability in Node or you populate a bunch of intentionally toxic nodes? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, and this is a problem that source routing can better address in comparison to greedy routing. Uh, the, the question was, is it possible for nodes that are malicious to compromise the network by inserting many nodes that route traffic in a bad way? Um, so in source routing, it means the source node actually has some level of control over how the packet traverses the network. Uh, I can go down a path, and then uh, it never reaches my destination. So I can change the directors to go for another path. So at least I can reach the other end through this uh, routing around bad nodes process. And then over the longer term, uh, the malicious nodes will get unpeered because they're like whose first hop peered to it is like it's getting no benefit from this node. So that, so there can be like some kind of blacklisting mechanism. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes and no. I mean, it still seems like there's potential for a uh, if, if the intention isn't to target a specific node or a specific type of traffic. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's some threshold over which negative, uh, the number of negative nodes would just start impacting and fragmenting the network as a whole. Right. Um, so I mean, the, misleading. I mean, yeah, I guess because it's encrypted and so on, you can determine mm -hmm. if you've if you've reached the right destination. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, you could do some pruning based on not r reaching an insufficient time. But right. Um, if you are, for example, sending back incorrect routing data as to your local neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, somebody in Oslo is, is telling, oh, telling somebody else going to Oslo, not where they are, but, you know, where their neighbors are or, or telling them the, the wrong things there, mm -hmm. then that would screw yeah. everything up. Yeah, if you start, like, telling people paths that are bad, uh, then 
th those paths will have to, to be get pruned from the routing tables, and then the network has to have some way of dealing with you, uh, that, like this player that's, that's announcing the bad paths. Uh, and and the, obviously, that g this gets into a, uh, a, a question of what percentage of nodes can be uh, can, can do what type of damage to a network, and also what is the cost of uh, generating generating many many nodes in the network. There's another question. Yeah, somebody just started the music in the next room. So, <laughs> uh, so I actually have two questions. Yeah. Um, one is uh, so this, uh, from my understanding, this is a full graph, so it's not the pre, <coughs> uh, but um, right. Uh, but the address assignment is um, based on the cryptographic hashes. So uh, what's the definition of neighborhood? It seems like you can end up wherever in the world and just get your neighbor uh, randomly. Uh. Yeah, so a neighborhood is a network neighbor. It is determined by your XOR distance. So if, uh, if we take our IPv6 addresses and XOR them, uh, and the first difference bit is uh, like the most significant bit, then we're in very distant neighborhoods. You are in the other half of the network that corresponds to my most significant bit bucket. Uh, so, so that's so I will only keep maybe ten nodes in each routing table, uh, that in each bucket of that corresponds to each of the each of the bits. Uh, so, I will only know ten nodes from that entire half network space. Whereas if, if our, we're, you're right next to me, like our IPv6 address only differ by the last bit, then I would have 10 slots to hold all that, so, so your node would always be in my routing table. Yeah, but you could be anywhere in the world, uh, even if the, if the, if the uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why, uh, th that's the point about um, XOR space having no resemblance to physical space. So neighborhood is not like real world neighborhoods. So, so that, uh, okay, so because then how, how you introduce like, uh, how, how do you do your bootstrap? Uh, how do you introduce yourself to the network at all? And secondly, right. uh, uh, what's the mean and max uh, query? Uh, the, the number of queries you need to do to get to a node, uh, mean mm -hmm. and max. Uh, I, I do not know the answer to like the min and max question, uh, but how do you enter the network in the first place? You need a peer. You have to peer uh, to any node that's connected to the network. Um, and it, CJDNS does it through uh, like uh, local peering. So if I run a laptop here and then you have a laptop that's running CJDNS, we will peer because we're on the same Wi-Fi network or we have a cable to each other. Uh, but it, you can also tunnel over the internet to peer and that requires like uh, coding other person's peering information into like manually. Okay. Uh, which brings us to uh, so all these routing problems uh, for specific use cases bring us to the next part, uh, the Eggdrasil network, uh, named after the mythical world tree, is shares the same addressing scheme with CJDNS, similar. Uh, it also uh, does a end-to-end -end encrypted network, but it routes traffic completely differently. That has resemblance to physical topologies of the network. Um, so now this is the geographic uh, neighborhood thing. It, in this way, it allows all the nodes to make some assumptions about the network, uh, but without holding the full view of this tr routing tree. It guarantees that there's a way to route to each node and uh, because it's a spanning tree, you, it, it would be, uh, I think it would scale to log n. Um, and it's a very new project, but so far, uh, nodes usually get the shortest paths. So, Egdrasil does a spanning tree at the switch layer. And it elects a global root to, to act as the zero, zero, like as the origin of that tree, the tree root. It, it still uses a distributed hash table to look up coordinates given the IP address, because like if I know a IP address and I don't have no idea where it is, I can still use DHT to query it in order to learn the, IP, the, the, the coordinates. Um, the edges of the tree are always direct peers, uh, and it's ranked because you might have like 10 peers, uh, but 
the edges are based on stability of that link. So this immediately adds a, some knowledge of local uh, like physical space into our routing. And coordinates are shared with peers and cryptographically verifiable from the tree root. Uh, and the switch layer uses greedy routing instead of source routing. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, each node keeps a partial view of the tree only. And uh, this is the scaling is uh, order of p times log n. Uh, p meaning the, num the number of peering relationships in the network. There are two ways to route. The worst one being, there, well, there are not two ways to route. There are two, there's an upper bound to routing. The upper bound to routing is walking the tree. Uh, but most of the time, because we're using greedy routing, which means I pass a packet to you, assuming that it would go walk the tree, but then you having knowledge to more than what the graph, what the tree knows, uh, you can just pass it down a different path. That's like a shortcut. So let's do, do an example of this. It's, it's a lot of information. Uh, there's a node here that's green. Uh, the yellow nodes are the ones that it is directly, that it has a, that it, ha that it has a cable connecting, basically. Um, and now we're trying to route from this to D40C. Its global coordinate would be 352, which is like this node, this node right here. So if you go down the tree path, it's going to go this node, that node, and then that node. But the greedy path is, hey, I'm already up here. I'm just going to send the packet right to this. Uh, and it's possible that a node doesn't actually know the, the tree roots. It just, but from some information based on its coordinate, it can infer some topology of the tree. Uh, and then it'll only learn about the tree root when it actually needs to use it. It'll send something, maybe if you would need to send something to that node, and then you'll go through the DHT and query its IP, and then, oh, you're actually a tree root. Yeah. Any questions about this so far? No? Okay. And, ah. So we have an ad. Uh, because we want a full internet experience. <laughs> so in putting together this, <laughs> in putting together the, these slides, I was talking with different people uh, that are designers of these protocols. Um, and in, because Egrasil is a very new project, uh, Neil, who is one of the contributors to this, uh, he was saying, hey, we actually need a lot of people to start scale testing this network because in theory, it will scale, scale very well. Um, so this is the matrix channel and IRC. If anyone was interested, join and ask for Neil Auxilia. Um, okay, so do we want to take a break or shall I continue? Just keep going. Let's do it. Okay, we're done with routing IP traffic. We're going to move on to application layers. Uh, internet interplanetary file system is a protocol that allows us to store distributed content on the IPFS network. It provides stable content addresses and to locate them and also verify integrity of those contents. Uh, we, it can do concurrent downloads. Say you're fetching a, uh, a big video, you can fetch the chunks from, from everyone. So kind of like BitTorrent in that sense. Um, and it would auto scale the network with uh, the network capacity with content popularity because like you start fetching it, you start seeding it to others. Uh, the lib2p2p is the networking layer that traverses NATs and uh, does announcements like node discovery. Um, it used to be part of IPFS, but now it's like its own project because like more other projects can actually benefit from something like lib2p2p. So let's talk about content addressing. It's the idea of referencing content by hash. In traditional internet traffic, we address by host. We go to youtube.com or we go to reddit.com um, and then they have the local addressing scheme. So when someone gives you content, you're trusting that they're giving you authentic content. Uh, but there's another way to address content based on hash. Uh, I can say, I want this. 
uh, and then you don't care where it comes from. It can be from an untrusted source because once you get the file, you can hash it, and then it gives you this hash. So that brings the question of what, hap what, what, what hashing algorithm is used to produce this hash. Uh, in IPFS systems, or, um, there are multi, uh, multi star uh, protocols like multi, multi hash, which are self identifying protocols, self identifying formats. Uh, so basically, the, uh, in this case, the 1-1 one one tells you it's a SHA-256, and then the 2-0 is the length of the digest. And then what follows is the hash. So the whole thing is the hash here. It's the address, I mean. Uh, and there are like multi-hash, multi-adder, all kinds of multi-star formats. Uh, what multi-address allows you to do is layer different protocols on top of one another. So you can see a uh, HTTP over TCP over IP6 in the first example. And then you can start layering things on top of the, uh, the Tor network uh, you know, that runs the Onion protocol. So you can bridge uh, content across different networks like this. So what, what does it actually look like downloading content from the IPFS network? First, you ask a peer. And this is how you get to the peer. You're talking IPFS protocol to a node ID over TCP, over port 4001, over IP6, that IP address. And I want to locate the content uh, that actually, uh, the content is actually located at this red address here. Uh, and you find it, you can download it through this other path. Once you have the content, you don't know this node that gave you the content, but you can do a SHA and then based on Based on the address, you know that it's a, it's a SHA-256, and you verify that it is the content that you want. And you also cache the content to help scale up the capacity of the network itself. So that's content addressing and uh, multi-formats in IPFS. Uh, we can move on to another network called the Ether. Uh, this is a very v2 of Ether. It's a very new project. It's now uh, in close, close alpha, or it should be released like within a month or so. Um, it, it's, like a, it's like Reddit, but peer-to-peer. -peer. It has to solve these problems of maintaining participant identities without a central authority. Uh, instead of having persistent content like IPFS, it optimizes for ephemeral content and metadata as well with spam deterring mechanisms. It facilitates community content moderation. So it has a layer protocol that's like specifically for moderations. Uh, it ensures that participants' actions are not trackable by, the, by uh, the servers, which also run on your same computer most of the time. Uh, but then the UI layer doesn't actually know, uh, doesn't actually expose any, any information of what the users are viewing. Uh, and fast and scalable synchronization across the network. So we have to talk about the idea of the Sukos triangle. Uh, you can get humanly memorable uh, names and secure names and globally unique identities without some sort of central authority. You pick two. So in, uh, in the other system, it uses a pet name system where um, the identity is a cryptographic key, so it's globally unique. And uh, everyone can self-select a memorable nickname and try to convince others to take it. But sometimes you have collisions, like we both choose the same name. Uh, I would choose Ben uh, as my other name. But that's a very common name, so there can be multiple Bens. So the viewer can actually resolve this by having uh, their own names to associate with the keys in a pet name system. You can say Ben from Toronto or like Ben from Oslo. They're two different identities, but even though they're advertising the same name. Um, the way that Ether deals with this is to have naming authorities that you can subscribe to, uh, and you can rank them to resolve uh, the user decision being the, the top priority. 
ma many of the many of the design decisions in Ether is like user priority overrides everything. Same with content moderation. Uh, to avoid spam across the network, uh, there's a proof of work mechanism that any action you take, even liking a post, requires you to like uh, do some do some computational work. So kind of like a Bitcoin type of proof of work, except you're like not actually mining anything. You're just mining your, you're just proving that I'm putting work into, uh, into this. And then all the nodes that are syncing th this information would verify the, the, the cryptographic proofs. Um, yeah, so with, with censorship and moderation, it's opt-in. Participant can say, uh, can you can opt into certain filters or moderators, but then you can vote out people, uh, or you can just like take them off your moderator list, uh, and then all their moderation would be would not take effect to your browsing experience anymore. Uh, Ethereum data syncs. Applications run both a front end and a back end. Uh, they're both running under the same application, so you don't really have to differentiate them, uh, except in low, in like constrained devices where my phone may not want to run a backend. Uh, this separation is very good because it allows me to run the backend on Raspberry Pi and my phone not having to run that at home. And because uh, compiled, uh, because data is like all pushed to the phone uh, from the backend, like not the full data, but uh, like counted data, like uh, if, if there if there are cryptographic proofs to all the all the likes of a post, uh, it doesn't have to send you uh, the counts. L like each like it, it can be a reduced data format, but the client still does the verification of, of the proofs on on the front end. Uh, this way, it the back end doesn't know what the user is browsing because it always sends everything. So after Ether, we can talk about the Skeletalverse, which is the list of projects built on top of secure Skeletalverse. Uh, in this case, we, I'm showing a, a snapshot of Patchwork, which is a social media, it's a social network um, that the network data topology is resembling of the friendships and social links uh, of the people that are participating in this. Uh, it optimizes for off-grid use, uh, does not assume constant internet connectivity, uh, prioritize subject subjective decisions, uh, data visibilities are local because uh, the data are hosted like among your friends. Uh, it, it maps the data topology to the network, to the social topology and it facilitates uh, discovery modes, uh, like meeting people in a virtual pub uh, that mirrors social interactions. So each person keeps a append-only database of signed messages, um, it uses pet name systems for identities, uh, and each participant signs and appends to this personal log. A friendship means a public key exchange so we each pin each other's public key and we, and we cache each other's data. Uh, messages are all signed for public and encrypted for, pri for private. Um, it allows us to control our own social bubble rather than having this algorithm that thinks this is content that I like and prioritizes those in my friend friendship feed. I have active control over this. I can like start unfriending a whole bunch of friends and I no longer cache the, their data and then I just start not seeing all those content. They're like not on my, on, on my uh, databases anymore. So we can go for an example of this. Uh, in this case, we have a uh, summer and Morty as friends. So each of them keeps a signed log. Morty is ke keeping a copy of Summers and S Summer keeps a copy of Morty's. Whereas in this other place, there's Unity, who is not a friend to that network, has no social link to that network. No one even know Unity exists in that, on, the, on the other side. So there's no global search. Uh, like you can type in an email address on Facebook and it searches the person. Uh, and there's no huge Facebook database to uh, to be profited off of, and also as an attack target to people who want to 
who want to steal that data for whatever purpose. So what happens to that graph when Rick joins the Scuttleverse? Rick is going to come in. Rick knows Morty and Unity. So Rick is going to clone Morty's database. And Morty is going to do the same thing. And then Unity is going to keep a copy of Rick's. So now all of a sudden, the worlds are connected. And you can adjust how many layers of caching you do. So in this case, Rick can actually uh, start caching friends of friends, for example. And then it'll see deeper into the network if it wants to. I know this is a really confused graphic, but it's only showing like first level uh, cachings. So when you start caching deeper, you can, uh, for example, I can, I can go online, sync data to uh, one of my friends, and then I go offline. But I'll, my mutual friend can go and uh, go online after while I'm offline, and they can sync that data from another from another node in the network. Okay, so we're done uh, looking at these six projects in the distributed network space. We can move on to talking about the politics that are embedded within these protocols. How are we on time? We're in one hour, right? Okay. So this is a part that's inspired by a, by a reading called Do Artifacts of Politics? Uh, do the, in, the, in infrastructure, do they uh, lead to certain societies? Or do they favor certain, certain societies, certain modes of controlling? Uh, that infrastructure and in turn controls uh, the behavior of people. So the question here is, do protocols also have politics? Uh, let's take some uh, example topics. Traffic routing on distributed non-hierarchical networks. So this is a quote from Axelia. Uh, For a large network to scale, it must be subnetted in smaller ones to, uh, to more easily manage them, which then must in turn be networked together to form a network of networks from internetwork connections, such as the internet and BGP and our ISPs. This requires some level of expertise and planning to do and tends to favor hierarchies wherein small networks are largely at the mercy of larger networks. The only connection your LAN has to another network in your, is your connection to, the, to an ISP. And peering or directly connecting to your neighbor's LAN to fetch information is very, very uncommon. So we can draw a ISP link like this. Uh, and if we start having self-addressing networks, we can have a, have a mesh like this. Um, we still need to go through some ISP, but at least this di diversifies um, uh, our choices. And having these uh, protocols that are not storing the entire BGP table, it allows us to start using uh, available hardware, cost accessible, and open hardware like the Libre router and Raspberry Pis. Uh, another topic we can discuss is name assignments. Uh, here's a quote from Ansus, uh, which builds a DNS system based on SSB. If I can, it's a monopoly. If ICANN's monopoly is a kind of feudalism, then Namecoin's method of associating records with tokens uh, is a kind of anarcho-capitalism. It means like uh, in Namecoin, there's a global blockchain where everyone can, uh, can uh, register a DNS record. So it's kind of, it's kind of like decentralized, the ICANN, but it's still like one global ledger that everyone references. And data aggregation. Uh, I, I hope here you can see how uh, DNSSD, something that's based on subjectivity and, and local uh, choices, uh, allows for something that's not that's neither ICANN or Namecoin uh, sharing bookmarks. You you just learn uh, mappings from people that you trust locally. Data aggregation that respect user privacy and agency. 
now that we have experience with some of the intricacies of the social web, we can reinvent it to put people's tr people first without intermediate companies. The peer-to-peer -peer protocol Secure Scarabat does that. Designed with diversity first principles that prefigure, hopefully, social structures with freedom, subjectivity, and political structures that can prevent capitalistic monopolies. This is from Andre Stoltz. Um, the internet is really exciting. It allows us to connect great geographic distances, but at the same time, we start thinking in a way that, like about global, uh, but is it really necessary for a lot of use cases to have this sort of go global consensus? Can we aggregate data for, uh, for a more local purpose? Uh, say, IoT, you have a bunch of smart devices in your home. Do you really need this to have global consensus with some other external system over the internet? So in this world, we can take what we derived from earlier and map the web content into the mesh itself. So we cut those ISP links all together. So the content is stored only at that local area. And the people who are interested in that content is only the people who are in that locality. Content moderation that prioritizes user interests over censoring authorities. Users can elect moderators in Ether, uh, impeach them, or just enable or dis disable them for themselves. So if somebody is unhappy with some moderators, she or he can just disable the ones that he doesn't think are doing a good job and choose new ones. So this is very important that they can disable certain ones. It's, uh, it prioritizes the user over any other community choice. This makes it so that people who participate in the communities actually have a say in how they are governed if they want to do so. This is by Barak, and he's uh, the, the sole author of Ether. Network participation that Encourage inclusive co-creations. Traditional networks require manual configuration of IP addresses. For one to get these addresses, one must join an internet registry and file a lengthy application. CJDNS nodes generate their own addresses along with the keys. When two nodes find each other, they connect. It sounds really simple in networking terms, which is usually very complex. Uh, Imagine like you trying to figure out how to connect to someone far away over, over existing internet infrastructure. There's so many layers you have to think about, but uh, when you start decentralizing some of these mechanisms, uh, it, makes, it makes things a lot more accessible in some ways. Uh, and being able to explain, being able to run CJDNS is only one part. It also requires uh, a lot of layers like, uh, like technical literacy, network technical literacy. If all that information is siloed somewhere in communities like uh, people who are building CJDNS or communities of techie people, uh, then it's not really inclusive, uh, especially in the creation process. Uh, so it's, it's important to do work on literacy material. This is uh, one of the projects by Toronto Mesh. Uh, which is like a set of mesh networking workshops where people can touch real hardware and like build ad hoc mesh uh, just in the room. Uh, resource allocation. This is a quote from Ramon of Giphy. Uh, we want to show that our open, free, and neutral network model is perfectly compatible with the market economy. It is about giving people another option and claiming the right of citizens to use the, to the use of telecommunications infrastructure in the spirit of the governance of common goods proposed by Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, so these are like a bunch of guiding principles uh, from Eleanor's writing, and they, are f they match very closely with the community processes and governance that occur at Giphy. Last section, fabric of our cyber commons. So from our earlier discussions, I want to start thinking about what are some of the guidelines, principles to help us imagine future networks uh, in a way that's different from uh, how we're building technologies now. Um, first, commons infrastructure versus monopolized lanes and distributed content over siloed data and people-centric should be really emphasized rather than, rather than based on some sort of extractive economics. So in a people-centric world, 
it's very important to recognize uh, people who are building the, the building these open source work. Uh, so for this presentation, we I, I used a lot of ideas from Andre Solves in his article, and uh, to artifacts of politics inspired a lot of the ideas here. Uh, references multiple designs, multiple protocols designs, and various discussions I've had with the contributors of these projects, uh, and uses and the creation of the presentation itself uses a bunch of open source software. It's copyleft, it's political, and it's free. Uh, free as in not locked in, uh, political as in instead of permissive licenses like Apache and MIT, we should favor copyleft uh, licenses that require reciprocal, um, reciprocal work rather than just exploiting the works of open source developers. Um, so this presentation is licensed under CC by SA, uh, and the source is available on GitHub. Offline first, rather than having assumptions of always on connectivities, uh, inclusive co-creations rather than high barrier to entry, infrastructure, knowledge, anything. Uh, and focus on local empowerment rather than uh, sneaking in these sort of imperialistic dependencies into uh, the way that we build for people. Um, so, true to that spirit, this that I'm running is actually served off of the Raspberry Pi over there. Uh, so my laptop is not connected to the internet. Uh, you can also log into this and see it for yourself if you like. Ah, I can show it actually. It's running off of here. And then it's permissionless, it's flat, and favors self-agency. Uh, so the, the less central control, the better. Uh, flat over hier hierarchies, and it's not authoritarian. Um, so this is uh, the Raspberry Pi over here is also running uh, a bunch of the protocols that I described, such as CJDNS, it has a self uh, IPv6 address. Oh, and the other one is my laptop. Uh, the peer is my laptop because I'm also running down on my laptop. So they peered because I'm like one of the AP clients. And is subjective, uh, over prescriptive, diverse, and forkable, rather than trying to have assimilate some type of monoculture. And because it's subjective, um, this is also just what I'm proposing. Uh, you don't have to agree with me. So the title of this talk really should be peer-to-peer -peer protocols for our cyber commons according to the hopes and dreams of Ben. And it's probably a pet name, Ben from Toronto Mesh. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Do we have time for questions? Um, I guess this is maybe not, or I, I have one specific question and, and it kind of ties in generally with uh, some of the things you presented. Mm -hmm. um, I played a little bit around with uh, a mesh network or a mesh virtual network uh, mm -hmm. software called Tink. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how that contrasted to some of the different protocols and then that kind of ties in. It was. Uh, Perhaps that was just me, but uh, it was a little confusing the distinctions between mm. some of the different uh, network and the different technologies because it seemed like they addressed very different problems at different layers mm. of a network stack. Some were much lower level, some were much higher level. Yes. Uh, it, it, was, there a, was there a question in there though? Always uh, Tink. Uh, so I'm not personally familiar with Tink. Uh, I, I think it's mostly used to construct VPNs. Is that okay? Uh, and is it similar to a wire guard? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think they're, you're exactly right that they, they are all slightly different. Uh, and there are th things, there are ideas where one takes from another. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Ting does any sort of self addressing. Um, but I, I know that there's also some talk about integrating Wirecard into CJDNS as like, uh, like to improve. There are like strings of each protocol and I think it's important to 
be able to take ideas from other projects and integrate. Uh, I, I was checking briefly about the uh, and from what I understood, CJDNS incorporates both the network aspect as well as doing the self-addressing. Mm -hmm. Tink leaves that aside. Um, but then it seemed like some of the other protocol, I mean, you had uh, the, the more network-oriented, setting up the networks and doing the mm -hmm. addressing, and then you had the IPFS, which is content-based addressing. Right. Those don't seem necessarily like they're in direct contrast with each other. Um, as and then the scuttle bit, I was a little bit unclear as to how the related to, for example, Yggdrasil and um, what was the uh, CJDNS and some of the others. Ah, okay. Uh, so because uh, most application, application layer stuff designed to work with IP, so the common interface is like IP. If you build something at the lower layer, like CJDNS and uh, Yggdrasil, that that's external API is IP, then it immediately allows any application to run on top of that. Uh, so it's also a bit about like uh, how you can work with existing systems because if you build something that's like from the ground up, single piece of thing, you must run the entire stack and change the entire internet, it's very hard for to get any sort of adoption. Uh, so the network layer, that's how I differentiate between uh, network protocols versus application protocols. Uh, CJDNS, sorry, uh, IPFS is very good for storing content uh, in a way that's, uh, that cannot be censored. Um, but then I don't want my personal information on a cannot be censored thing. So ultimately, I think the thinking of uh, SSB, Secure Scuttlebutt, is the prioritization of user choice. So if I want something to be very public, even though it might be against uh, current censorship authorities, uh, I can use um, IPFS to place that content. But my choice should still be prioritized. If this is like not what I want, I should be able to place it on a ethereal uh, platform like Ether. Thank you.